Well, hello, everyone. How are you guys doing tonight? Yeah, wonderful. Well, hi, my name is Alberto Gomez. Uh, I'm our digital producer at Sahan Journal. Uh, welcome to St. Paul Neighborhood Network. And thank you so much for coming to the firsts. Yeah, we're so excited. I'm Nina Moini from NPR News. We are co-hosting the Sahan Community Live and North Star Journey Live event. And tonight, as you all know, we are celebrating all things first. Maybe the first in your family to go to college or buy a house. Yeah, and speaking of home ownership, I want to give a quick shout out to tonight's sponsor. This event is generously sponsored by the Minnesota Home Ownership Center. You can meet with one of the home ownership advisors after the program to learn about the first generation, uh, about the first generation home buyers community down payment assistance fund. And you can get a grab bag. Oh, I, yeah, I peeked yeah, into the grab bag. Get your grab bag everybody. Oh, perfect. It's going to be a good show. I'm very excited. We're very excited. Mm -hmm. So we have a great group of firsts here tonight. Our amazing speakers have overcome uh, obstacles to achieve amazing successes in all areas. We're talking education, business, sports, and culture. We are thrilled to have them with us tonight. And we want to include your thoughts and questions during the show. So if you have questions, or perspectives for our speakers, you can text us. Here's the number, 651-504-8170. Again, the number is 651-504-8170. And at the end of each interview tonight, we'll ask some questions from the audience to our speakers. Yeah, that's right. The numbers are also on your stage, in case you forgot. Um, let's welcome our first speaker to the stage. Everyone knows her as the senator from South Minneapolis. But did you know in 2022, she was the first person under the age of 26 to win a seat in the Minnesota Senate. Everyone, can you please welcome Zainab Mohammed to the stage. your journey to becoming the first. Thank you, it's uh, it's good to be here this evening. Hi everybody and thank you Sahan Journal for hosting this important conversation. Um, wow, my journey. So I was a community organizer before I ran for office. I think for me the murder of George Floyd um, impacted me in many ways, pretty close to my neighborhood, um, and just seeing how our city came together and the impacts that um, it sort of had in terms of what it means for us to build power together as a community, test and question the institutions that um, that are doing the work and, and what our belonging looks like is sort of what got me to run. See, I'm, I'm only in my 20s, 24 to be exact, um, <laughs> and I can't imagine. You too. You too. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I couldn't imagine being a senator that young. Um, so how does it feel to be breaking this barrier to, to, to be starting this journey? Yeah, well I was 24 when I ran. Now I'm 27. When I was first running, I was 24. Um, you know, it's exciting. It is, it's a big deal, right? Um, and I feel honored and privileged to be able to do this, but it also comes with an immense amount of responsibility. Absolutely, and we know that running for office is uh, a big, huge undertaking, and being the first in this area, probably not an easy thing to do. What advice do you have for others who are looking to break into the types of roles in politics that you've pursued? Yeah, I mean, um, I would say get to know your community, understand the issues that are impacting them. Um, and often people run because those issues impact them. For me, I cared a lot about housing. I care. I was a child of Section 8 vouchers that impacted my family and helped my family in many ways. And so understanding who in our community that helps um, and how we can sort of sustain a program like that at the state level and talking to people, my neighbors, and understanding who was on Section 8 vouchers, why they were on it, how do we get people out of poverty, um, was what connected me to the community, what made me feel like I could sort of do this role and this job. Um, but, you know, like the issues that impact all of us are often impacting our neighbors, and it just starts with a conversation with your neighbor and ask them, what do you need, what are you going through, what am I going through, and how 
can we do? Mm, get to know the issues, get to know your community, a good place to start. On the topic of uh, your community and your, your family especially, um, this is no small undertaking to become a senator. How did they react when you finally achieved this? <laughs> Well, when I first told my mom I was running, I'm obviously an immigrant myself, a child of immigrants, and my mom said, um, why don't you just go to medical school? <laughs> <laughs> and like, get a real job. <laughs> and then when I, was won, when I won and we had um, a small party at, at a restaurant in the district, my mom was there and she's like, wow, I like, thought you were getting a new job. Everyone's so excited and like clapping for you. <laughs> and so, you know, my family was really excited. They were, they were obviously really supportive, um, but it took a lot of convincing because being in the public eye comes with a lot of scrutiny. Yeah. Well, it looks like we're, we are still collecting audience questions, so, but I do wonder, just me personally, when you've encountered challenges, which I'm sure you have, of people saying, oh, well, you're too young for me to listen to what you're saying, you know, uh, how do you manage that? How do you approach that? And what advice might you have for others who are younger and want to get in there, want to be in the mix? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm young, but I think when I was running, I, I wanted people to respect me, and I wanted people to understand what, where I was coming from, my perspective, and why I was doing it. So often I was like trying to find ways to physically look long, older, right? Which is kind of impossible to do when <laughs> you know you're me. Um, and you know, just this past session, I was in my office. I was standing right in front of my office, and this older couple comes in and they're like, hey, are you Senator Muhammad? And I'm like, oh yeah, it's really nice to meet you. And they're like, you look a lot younger. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm young. And so the woman looks at me up and down and she goes, are you even old enough to serve? Hmm. And I'm like, I think so. <laughs> I think so. I'm here. <laughs> you know, I'm here. But like, you know, I deal with stuff like that all the time on the doors. Um, and then there are people who just are just so excited to just see, uh, you know, somebody who's the the age of their child be in office, represent um, represent them, do good work. And so it comes with a little bit of a awkwardness often. But if I can just be like, you know, I might be the same age as your daughter or your son, but I'm doing, I think, a pretty good job. Thank you. Um, we do have one question from the audience. Uh, you've mentioned a few times that it's a privilege, but also a burden. What are the hard things about being in the public eye? Yeah, um, you know, I personally, when I ran for office, I, I'm somebody who ran because I have a deep understanding of how policy impacts people um, in a tremendous way. Everything that we do is political, every issue that is passed, every policy that's done impacts people in a different way. Um, and I think being in the public eye, often people forget that electeds or politicians, they are not like, um, what's the right word, like a celebrity, that they, that we're just regular people who do regular jobs, and right. outside of this, we have actual jobs, right? Um, and it's hard to sort of uh, have like a deep understanding of like, how do you show up in a public eye and do a good work, but then also have people sort of humanize you as just like a regular human. Yeah. But it's all about just like understanding at the end of the day what you're doing, why you're doing, and then like letting people know, I'm just a regular girl from South Minneapolis. Yeah, and just focusing on the work. Uh, Zainab Mohammed, thank you so much for joining us tonight and being so open and sharing. We're going to talk with you later in the show, but for now you can uh, take your seat again. Uh, you know, many immigrants come to this country to start a better life. Some start their own businesses and others purchase land and become organic farmers. <laughs> and not everyone, but our next speakers know a thing or two about becoming an organic farmer. Everyone, please welcome Rodrigo Kala to the stage. <laughs> Elevator music, as, again, <laughs> as you make your way to the stage. <laughs> How are you doing today, Rodrigo? <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Organic farming, we're excited to learn about it. Thank you so much for being here tonight, Rodrigo. Um, so you come from a family of farmers. How does it feel to be the first in your family to own land in the United States? 
Mm -hmm. I can I can talk a little bit about my history and my journey. Um, I arrived in this country in 1998. I was working in a factory for 10 years making horseshoes. We was the person who made the tooling and teaching the robots. We making 8,000 horseshoes every four hours in each line. But at the same time, I grew up in a <coughs> in Mexico City, mm -hmm. in, uh, in a rural community in, in Mexico City. And I, I remind that when I, we, when I take trainings in Minnesota. Um, so the main thing for me is, was to thinking I wanna buy a, a house, but at the same time, I have the opportunity to buy a farm. Mm -hmm. And it's the same time, and I build my credit from zero. I take um, business classes for my farm. So one of the main things I, I figured it out in the beginning was uh, the power for, for getting your own land. So take for me <coughs> six years to, to do that. Hmm. And one of the main reasons to do that is I really like to be on open spaces. So when I get the opportunity, I learn about the system, I learn about how this country runs, because when I arrive here, I don't speak any word in English. Mm. So I, I, I learn a few different things about language, uh, computer use, and how this country runs. Mm. So as soon as I get that, so then I have the ability to, to get this, 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 this farm. Yeah, there's so much drive and discipline that you have to have as an immigrant, right? To come to a new country and to learn a language and learn how the financial system works. And you did all of that, which is uh, so worthy of celebration. You now own a 46 acre organic vegetable farm in Turtle Lake, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. 46 acres. And that's about an hour and a half from the Twin Cities for anyone who's wondering. Tell us specifically about organic farming, first of all, like, what does it mean, <laughs> and um, how does how did that come to be for you? Okay, um, organic farming is we don't we don't spray any com I mean, zero any uh, conventional things on the farm, mm -hmm. any sprays or any uh, conventional fertilizer. We don't spray that. We really work in with the nature, so, so we can grow healthy and delicious food mm -hmm. in the farm. So one of the main things I see is the economical way to see to see my farm. I, at the beginning I was thinking it I can I can I can um, I can be my farm in two, in two ways like a hobby farm or a, a business. Hmm. So one of the main things changed my life in this country is when I was working in a, in a fast food restaurant and people, the manager on, on, at that time, he told me the Mexican people are hard workers and I, in, in some ways it's very good for people but in other ways very offensive. Why? Because we have the skills, we have the abilities to run businesses, not just to work hard. Mm -hmm. So when I, hmm. when I start see my journey on farming, because because I work, work I was working on this factory, and then I switching for farming is totally different life. Mm -hmm. And one of the main things to working on a different day every day. And I have like a one minute history mm -hmm. about today. I, I start my <coughs> my day really, really early in the morning. Mm -hmm. My my truck my tractor oh. broke down. <laughs> and I was really on a hurry with, with time. And I was working with one of all my coworkers <laughs> and I just try to run in so fast because I need to be on time in here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then as soon as I 
I tied the last bulb, so the, the cutter, because we, we harvest corn today, and we are in a hurry. Mm -hmm. So then I, I start running, and I my daughter, she has everything ready for me. So I, so she told me, we, we don't have enough time to you, for you to take a shower. <laughs> so, You're fine, it's all fine. So then I take my keys, and I say, okay, let's, 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 let's go. And you know, farming is a, I don't gonna lie to you, it's, it's really a different life. Mm. It's, it's, it's not a life for everybody, mm -hmm. but if you have the ability to, <clears throat> to enjoy that, I mean, you are in the other side. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who's going to be listening to this and can't see, you pulled a wrench out of your pocket. Because <laughs> yeah. he's on the go. <laughs> Always prepared, right? Yeah. Uh, Rodrigo, you work with uh, Minnesota's Latino Economic Development Center to help other immigrant farmers get into organic farming. You know, uh, when you meet with these farmers, what advice do you often give them? Okay, the first thing what I tell them is we need to we need to sh we need to shift uh, we need to change of um, brain of, of of thinking. Why? Because. In this country, you really need to you don't need to think in in a business when you when you get a farm. If you don't have enough money to pay the mortgage, you need to really set your mind like, okay, how much money I I need for for paying the mortgage? How much money I need to for buy a tractor? How much money I need to for buy a truck? How much time am I gonna spend for 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 going to a market? So. Your brain need to need to switch switch really really a lot. Hmm. So it's what I try to tell the the new the new immigrants or the new farmers, like start small, rent a piece of land for a few years, focus on the business side, and then if you figure it out about what produce or what things you, you you can sell or you can offer to people, then you are you are in good in a good track. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Should we get one audience question in? I think we have a couple today. Would you want to go? Sure. So one of our audience questions for you, Rodrigo, is how does being first generation influence the way you do your work or live your life? What are the, the strengths and challenges? Well, uh, having the ability to, to get land on this country is so powerful for me because when I when I finish my day, I, I feel like this is mine. Hmm. So one of the main things for people, it's it's uh, this this country is no uh, country of dreams. It's it's, the, it's it's a country of calls and opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you have the ability to figure it out that from the beginning, then you can change your life and the life of your or, or your for all your family. And for me. Try to encourage. I mean, people. They when when people thinking about farming, the people they thinking it's a it's a dumb person or it's a poor person. It is not true. I mean, farming is a really huge industry. Mm -hmm. I encourage uh, I encourage my kids to developing apps, to develop developing uh, machinery, developing programs for computers about try to help in farmers. So the the opportunities for the new generation is huge. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so one of the main things on this country, uh, the age of farmers on this country is 58 years old. Mm -hmm. So who is going to be the next generation of farmers on this country? Mm -hmm. Immigrants can be can be one of the solutions. And I think the cake is so big. So if a new immigrant thinking or wants to be on, 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 on a farm business, I think the opportunities are big. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the next question we have from our audience is, uh, can you talk about the struggle to represent the opinions of your community, but also trying to be yourself? The language. <laughs> How do you mean? Barriers. Um, and when, when I was talking about, I mean, people refer to Latino community like hard workers. In this country, there is like three or four million of, of farm workers, mostly in the south of the country, California, uh, Florida, Texas, um, Arizona. Uh, so 
so when when you see a Latino, this is the history, what's happened to me on, my farm is 70 miles from here. Mm -hmm. It's in the middle of a very conservative community, white community. So when people, <laughs> when people approach to me, and they say, hey, I want to buy some chickens, I want to buy onions, I want to buy winter squash, and they, they see me and they can I can I speak to you to, to the boss or to the owner? Mm. And I say, I am the boss. I am the owner. <laughs> 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 so it's one of the one of the main things I see over over the years. We need to believe in ourselves. We need to believe in our capacities. Mm -hmm. We deserve. We deserve, we deserve nicer mm -hmm. things too. And one of the main things, if we believe on that, that thing is going to happen. If you, if you don't believe you deserve, then that thing don't going to happen. I think we got one more question. We got time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, this one's going to lighten the mood. Uh, what is your favorite crop to grow? Oh. And what would you <laughs> like to grow sometime in the future? Um, my favorite crop is to garlic and broccoli. Ooh. Why garlic? Yeah, and why? Yeah. Because all the communities, they they, they looking for those. <laughs> Every community, I mean, it's no matter where you came from, you're going to eat garlic and broccoli too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's some confirmations in the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Rodrigo. It was wonderful having you up here. Thank, I will talk to you later in the show, yeah? Yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to share my history. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Every single person in here, honestly. Can we just have like a dedicated night for everyone? Is that yeah. something we could do? <laughs> Um, so I'm wondering, uh, Umberto, talking about firsts, yeah. very exciting. Mm -hmm. We probably have some other firsts in the room. Yeah, I wonder, <clears throat> do we have anyone in the crowd who would be comfortable sharing their first story? Are they the first in their family to do anything impressive? I know I'm personally the first one to fall on stage while singing Xanadu and roller skates. So if anyone can cop top that, I'd be impressed. It doesn't have to be that specific either. <laughs> I mean, it could be. <laughs> oh, do I see anyone in the crowd? Can I give just a quick... Very low stakes. I, have a, I, I can walk up to you as a matter of fact, so you don't have to be on stage. Oh. Hand raise, anyone? Hold on. Over here, you look a little shy, but do you have anything you would like to share with the crowd tonight? I do not, sorry. All right, we'll keep going around. We're gonna try two more people. How does that sound? Over here, hello. Hi, I'm Alberto, what's your name? Hi, my name is Melania. Melania, are you the first in your family to do anything? Um, yes, I think so. Well, what is it? Um, I'm the first full-time Karen interpreter in the state of Minnesota, which makes wow. me the first one in the nation. Okay, that, give her a hand for that. That is no small shrug. How does it feel? Doesn't, I think when you have self-affirmation, it doesn't really matter what people say. You just keep going in your journey and better the community. And what is this, uh, what is being a translator? Did I mute this? What does being a translator for your community mean for you personally? Yeah, so I'm a court interpreter, so I interpret for defendants that speak the Korean language. Um, the population that I work with, they're uh, refugees, and where they come from, there's no such thing as, you know, due process or law. Um, so I think it's important to represent them and show them that there's nothing to be fearful and we're in a new country and, you know, there's no bribery, um, you're not guilty, the first thing you, you know, when you're seen in front of a judge. So just being there. Is there anything else, is there anything else you would like to share with the crowd tonight before we move on to our next segment? Yeah, I just moved here from Colorado, so I, I would love to get connected with everyone, make friends. I live in uh, 
west of Minneapolis. So we'd like, love to get connected and get to know people. <laughs> well, thankfully, you'll have plenty of opportunities later in the night. Uh, we'll, we'll be having a nice meet and greet with everyone. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Yeah, that was really, really nice. Thank you for sharing. And I know everybody is very humble and doesn't want to, you know, speak up. But we, so we have an easier question for you. Do we have any sports fans in the audience? Yeah. Yeah? I'm hearing a couple quiet. Well, we've got one. <laughs> okay, how about specifically any soccer fans? Okay, a little more excitement. We love to hear that. We have a wonderful treat for you today. Our next speaker is a wonderful soccer star. In 2020, Michael Vang became the first Hmong soccer player to play professionally in the United States. Michael, do you want to come up stage and join us? Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you for being here. Yeah, Michael, uh, so we understand you started playing the sport very young. Uh, what was that like for you and then your journey then to becoming a first? Um, I, I got started at five years old by a movie called Shaolin Soccer. Uh, my dad, <laughs> my dad kind of introduced that to my siblings and I at a young age, and after that we started going out to the backyard playing right away, and it just kind of took off from there. Um, when I reached, I think, age 13, 14, I finally realized that this was something I could do as a career in the future. And um, when I was 16, uh, that was my first time moving away from home to attend Shattuck St. Mary's, which is a boarding school in Fairboat, Minnesota. Um, and I was really fortunate enough to spend two years there, graduate, and I committed to uh, play Division I at University of Pacific, but I decided to forego my college uh, playing career to go to Portugal for about a year and a half to two years. And things didn't work out over there for me. So <laughs> That's okay. I decided, yeah, I decided <laughs> to come home <laughs> and I actually ended up working at Target for about, I would say two days, <laughs> and, and uh, okay. yeah, two days, and I realized that I still wanted to chase my dream to become a professional soccer player, and I was only 19 at the time, and um, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it one more try, so I went to an open tryout at Ford Madison. Uh, and thankfully that worked out for me and I was able to sign my first contract um, at the age of 19 and kind of just took off from there. I was able to travel around the, the U.S. playing for Columbus Crew, Portland Timbers, and also Miami FC. And then I was really fortunate enough to represent Laos, where my ancestors came from. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, I was able to play in the FIFA World Cup qualifiers first round. Wow. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that was just a really special moment for me. That's kind of where it is. Just to follow up, do you sit and think, oh, I'm a first, I'm a first? Or what does it mean for you within your culture to, to be in this position? Uh, it means a lot because I was able to finally be the, the first one to break down that barrier for Hmong people to make it to the professional level. And it does come with a lot of pressure and responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, but I think being able to be an example for the younger generation and to inspire the youth to, you know, want to reach my you know, reach where I came from, uh, where I ended up or go past me. So sure. that's something that I'm really proud of and really excited to see as well. The first, but you don't want to be the last. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, Michael, you mentioned just, just two days at Target. What pushed you to, to say, no, this isn't it. This isn't what I want. I don't know if you can even say you worked there. <laughs> you visited, yeah, I wouldn't, visited. I, I wouldn't say I, I don't yeah, know. But, like um, paperwork. <laughs> yeah, it was, just, um, it was just, I 
would work that nine to five job and I didn't really have time to, to train for you know anything and I just felt like my heart wasn't it wasn't finished and you know my goal was it was still there to achieve and it was really it was close I felt like I was right there I just needed the the right person uh, to give me a chance impressive so um, you come from a family of soccer players in fact your father uh, Tay Vang started the St. Paul United Soccer Club on the east side <laughs> yeah, very impressive <laughs> uh, what are some of the challenges you overcame in your journey to become a soccer player? I was always the smallest person on the field. Um, yeah. So that was kind of a, a challenge for me. I was playing two years up every time with my brother. Um, being able, like being at the the height of their chest or you know their stomach, even uh, it was really tough for me. But I think that's what also got me better as a player. Uh, it gave me a lot of different ways to kind of dribble the ball, pass the ball, and you know different movements I could do. And I think that's what really helped my game as I got older. Mm -hmm. So we understand you actually retired from the game in June 2023, so like last summer, but your love and, and your passion for it, I'm assuming, continues, clearly. Uh, what are you doing to give back or to kind of stay within the, the atmosphere of soccer? So yes, unfortunately I did retire. Um, through a uh, ACL and MCL injury mm. and also a, a broken ankle as mm. well. So Sorry. yeah, but I just I just wanted to be able to walk in like the next 10, 15 years. Sure. So That's a reasonable goal. Uh, yeah. But yeah, now to be able to to stay around the game, um, I've held camps for kids to come and join and train. And um, I recently started a nonprofit organization um, called Michael Vang Sports Foundation to give lower income families the opportunity to play club sports with emphasizing on their mental wellness as well. Uh, I think that's a really important thing that athletes go through, especially myself um, mm -hmm. in my professional career. I definitely hit some pretty hard times in my life uh, mentally. So I think kind of the experience that I went through, um, I know that there are a lot of athletes that are seeking help, that need help in this, um, this field and their sports psychology is relatively a new field to study in. Um, so I decided to take that route and do my master's in sports psychology mm -hmm. and yeah, so right now that's kind of where I see myself heading into. Amazing. Fantastic. We have uh, our first audience question for you. Besides your parents, who were your biggest champions? <laughs> um, I would say all my siblings in their very own unique way. Um, you know, my brother, we, my brother Brian, my uh, sister who's in the audience, Chelsea, and my older sister, uh, Maddie, they, we've all, you know, gone outside and trained together. So we all pushed each other every single day to try to get better. Um, unfortunately, Chelsea ended her career early with an injury, but you know, Brian and Maddie, they knew how to get the best out of me and I did the same with them. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I'd be here or would have achieved anything without, you know, the push of my siblings. Mm. Amazing, thank you for sharing that. Another audience question, uh, probably our last one here. What is your favorite team in the English Premier League? <laughs> There's a right answer here. <laughs> <laughs> um, see, I don't really have a team in the Premier League. I'm more of a Barcelona fan. But if I were to support a team right now, it would be Arsenal. So Arsenal is the team that I would support. Okay, we're all entitled to our opinions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think those are all the audience questions that we have right now. But I am curious, if I were to purchase an older copy of FIFA, can I play as you? It wouldn't be on there. I don't know if you guys know the game eFootball, um, but I am on that game. Ooh, yeah, cool. so if you guys want to, you guys could probably look me up on that game. <laughs> I probably would be on there, but uh, with Miami FC, um, 
Um, but yeah. That's probably another first. Yeah. Michael, thank you so much. We'll catch up <laughs> thank with you. So you. Much. Thank you we'll so much. We'll catch up with you it. again in a little of bit. Course. Have a wonderful time. You guys enjoying the show so far? Yeah. Thank you, wonderful. Well, we're gonna take a small five minute break mm -hmm. and we'll socialize, say some nice hellos, maybe grab another bite to eat, I need some coffee. And then we'll be back with a nice, fun performance. How does that sound, yeah? All right. All right, break. We'll be back in five. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, if you're just joining us, I'm Nina Moini with NPR News. And I'm here with Alberto Gomez from Sahan Journal for a combined North Star Journey Live and Sahan Journal Conversation where we are celebrating first. So remember, you can send your thoughts, your questions for our speakers by texting this number 651-504-8170. Again, that's 651-504-8170. All right, we can't wait to hear what you have to ask our speakers tonight. Nina, are you ready to laugh? I am. <laughs> You're a fan of comedy, I take it? Who isn't uh, a fan of comedy? <clears throat> I think we have a wonderful uh, stand-up comedian tonight. Would you like to introduce him? Yeah, so coming to the stage now, and feel free to come on up, we have Abenezer Merdasad. Come on down. <laughs> Hello. Hi. You can you, have a seat for a first with. if you want, yeah. yeah. I'll sit, I'll get comfortable. Yeah, All thank right. you so much for being Hello. here. <laughs> Hello, Ebenezer, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good, how are you guys doing tonight? Uh, great. I'm living the dream, uh -huh. I, I dreamed of this moment. <laughs> 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 no, we're, we're very excited to have you on stage. Uh, but I think our audience would like to get to know you a little bit. Um, so, real quick. Um, how, what got you into comedy? And how did your family react when you said, this is what <laughs> you want to do? They were not very happy. They were not. <laughs> I had I had real tangible aspirations. Uh, I was I was in college. I was I was studying to be a software engineer, and then it was finals, and I was looking for anything except for studying to do. And I found an open mic <laughs> nearby, and I've done it for six years. <laughs> Still haven't taken that exam. But <laughs> amazing. Well, thank you. Uh, we'd love to have you uh, start your show. Awesome, yeah. awesome. All right, nice. Hello, how are you guys doing? You guys good? Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Yeah, g g give yourselves a round of applause one time for being here today. This is fun. Give it up for Sahan Journal, your host for tonight. They've been very nice. Is this on? I don't know if this is on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah, my name is Ebenezer. I, I'm happy to meet you. A lot of important people. I am the clown for the night. I'm the, <laughs> I'm the ease. Um, uh, yeah, I'm an immigrant. I moved here when I was like 10, 11 years old, which is fun. I love eagles. I love guns. I love everything they do here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, moving, moving here was great, except for like <laughs> one thing I discovered when I got here. Um, I found out that like a lot of Americans like to use my childhood as blackmail when their kids act up or they won't eat. They just go like, hey, think about all those kids in Africa. <laughs> How are you guys? You guys thought about me? <laughs> Dude, my fondest memories are why some of you guys ate broccoli and drank milk. So this is, <laughs> this is amazing. It gave me strength. <laughs> um, I come from a very religious family, very religious family. And my mom's, uh, my mom, like, she, like, loves God. Uh, I'm like, so much so that she, like, learned English. Rosetta Stone from the Bible. <laughs> And so, like, a lot of my texts are, like, unnecessarily beautiful, you know? <laughs> like, one time, my phone was like, ding, and then I looked at it, and it said, my beloved son, <laughs> you have forgotten your headphones in the basement. <laughs> Be blessed, you know? <laughs> she talks to me in King James, you guys. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> uh, moving here was fun. Um, I will say there was, like... There's like a, a, some conflicts I never expected, if I'm gonna be real. Like when I first moved here, a lot of kids were like, you smell like food, 
<laughs> Why? <laughs> Why do you always smell like food, you know? And I was just like, hey, that's just what my mom loves to do, you know? <laughs> I don't ask you why you smell like Chardonnay all the time, do I? No, I'm not. <laughs> oh. Things were weird, man. <laughs> Things were weird. Like, I remember when I first got here, Harry Potter was all the buzz, and I tried to get into it, and it was tough for me because I was just discovering the English language, and a lot of their words are made up, right? It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> but I went, <laughs> to, this was going to be a heavy one, guys. Uh, <laughs> but I went back to it as an adult, and um, I don't know. I don't think it's for me, like the story. <laughs> Because it's about a group of people that like to meet in secret places. They dress in cloaks. <laughs> they're chosen by bloodline and they're led by a grand wizard. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know a group like that and uh, they're not sending me any letters, you guys. You know, they're not. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't like wizards, to be honest, though, just in general. I think we're beyond them. Because you could walk up to one and be like, Oi, mate, I have this magic mirror. <laughs> it lets you talk to anybody in the realm. And you're like, yeah, but that's FaceTime, though. You know, like, we got that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just think we're beyond them. But I do think there's one thing everybody's excited for that we're not, like, there yet, which is, like, aliens. Everyone's, like, hyped up. I don't think we're there yet. I, like, I don't mean, like, technologically. I just mean socially. <laughs> because we are all the human race, and yet we've had things like racism. <laughs> Can you imagine how bad we're gonna be when there's like an actual different race here? <laughs> how terrible we're gonna be to them? And yo, if we're not, I'm gonna be a little offended. I'm not gonna lie to you, you know? <laughs> I just wanna ride with y'all once. <laughs> I wanna be a wizard. <laughs> I don't know. I'm in love, anybody else here in love? <laughs> <laughs> a loveless room. I guess room. <laughs> maybe that could be a first you guys could try out us. <laughs> I'm in love. <laughs> I guess since you guys don't know, I'll let you know. It's pretty fun. <laughs> it's pretty fun. Uh, I like to think of myself as like a romantic guy. I like to think of myself as a romantic guy. Here's what I do to make my relationship last. Um, like my girlfriend, she loves to travel, but she hasn't gotten to do that recently. And so what I do to simulate that experience for her is just like, I'm just really distant when we talk, <laughs> you know, so I can make her feel like we're worlds apart, uh, but I'm right there, you know, that's, that's what I do for love, gentlemen, you know, <laughs> this Valentine's Day, ghost her, okay, just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh man, how, how much time do I have? Uh. Do one more and get out of here? Okay, I'll do one more and get out of here, okay, yeah. I'll do one more and get out of here. Um, Let's see, uh, I, I am looking for new friends tonight. I'll, I'll say this, I'm looking for new friends. I don't like my friends. <laughs> uh, I think they're terrible people. Uh, this, this is what really got me, this is what really got me. My buddy, he went through a breakup and I was, a I was on the phone with him and he was crying and I was totally cool about it. I didn't giggle once or anything and he has a full beard, you know, talking about, <laughs> I didn't laugh once, you know? <laughs> and at one point he was just like, you know what, man? You've been there for me since high school, college, and now. And I was like, yep. And then he was like, I hope the day comes when I can be there for you when you feel this way. And I hung up on him immediately, right? Because <laughs> that's, that's an awful person. Dude, if I'm your friend, I don't ever want to be there for you. That is an indication that things have gone wrong. But here, this man is just hoping, you know? <laughs> just praying that calamity strikes me. <laughs> He was just like, yo, I hope somebody smashes your heart into a thousand pieces just so I could text you. Keep your head up, dog. Like, what yeah. are you talking about? <laughs> All right, that's my, that's my time. My name's Ebenezer. Aww, yay. Thank you guys for having me. If you guys want to see me, I'll be at Comedy Corner tomorrow. And sa yeah, okay. All right, bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so oh much, Abenezer. Oh, my goodness. How about another round? Come on. Oh, just one He's more. He's great. He needs it. It was like, there was like, you know. Yeah. All, all topics. I, I'm emotionally devastated. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we've had trailblazers of, of all types tonight, from uh, politics to sports. And we're not done yet. 
No, no, not even close. We're only halfway through this show. <laughs> Our next speaker is not shy of expressing herself through writing. She's a writer and one of the first Karen Children book authors in Minnesota. Please welcome to the stage, Ramona Tu. And here she comes, and she has a copy of her book with her, and we're so happy. But first, we want to just ask you a few questions, Ramona. Thank you so much. Thank yep, and that's for you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your story of being a first. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, being a first. I don't, like, you know, growing up, like, you know, talking about yourself, like, in my culture is known for being very <laughs> humble. Yeah. So don't talk about ourselves, or otherwise you'll be considered being, what is the word for cop? <laughs> yeah, but, well, but you know what? Tonight's an exception. Okay. You're allowed to yeah. pick yourself up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I will talk about me then. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> So, as you know, the uh, current community in Minnesota is rapidly growing. There are over 1,500 student, er, residents living in the state. And as of this year, St. Paul launched an elementary program in the Karen language and culture at Wellstone Elementary. As an author, what does it mean for you to see your culture and your language incorporated at schools? Oh, it's, it means so much to me. And then also, like, you know, I can say that for, like, the community, too, because, um, you know, like a few years ago, I talked so I moved to Minnesota, uh, Minnesota about six years ago. Okay, and um, there's like a big population of Hmong here, and, and you know the community is like resettled, and then they have you know um, what it, form like these like uh, community services, and you know there's like schools, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, like you, in every corners, you know, especially like I live in the East St. Paul area, so. Um, but for like uh, the current community, it's like, oh, I wish, you know, we, you know, we have a, uh, a current class in school. So I'm like, wow, you know, I would love to see that. So like just not too long ago, I heard about the news, so I, like I was thrilled. And, it, and it, it's all, it means so much to me because, you know, growing up, um, you know, like for 10 years, I lived in refugee camp. So for 10 years, you know, I never questioned my, uh, myself, like, who am I? You know, I know that I'm Korean. You know, I grew up around the Korean, you know, among the Korean people, like, you know, the language, the culture. But then, like, I moved here when I was 12. So, like, I have uh, having to learn, like, a new language, new cultures, right? And then, you, and, you know, try to fit in, especially, like, that age, that around that age is not easy. So, um, you know, it's like try to fit in like I try so hard that like you know I feel like I'm losing like part of like myself you know so like I know that like for the future generations like you know kids that you know just got resettled here I know that they'll they'll try so hard and like you know question themselves like who am I like you know where do I belong right so like having like you know the, uh, the current culture and like the language incorporated in like the St. Paul public school um, it's like it's so crucial to me because you know I want kids that grew up here that came here at like either like early age they are born here. I want them to you know maintain the language you know also like you know um, like knowing who they are exactly among like so many like diverse like culture backgrounds you know and then also like coexisting like with other culture and like you know p uh, people from different uh, backgrounds and just like you know. It's so important to me because, like, you know, if you know who you are and, like, you know, and, like, you don't question who you are, like, then, you know, it's, I feel like we can coexist so much smoothly. Absolutely. And I think what you say really resonates with so many of us who are immigrants and uh, are between cultures or in different cultures. And, you know, you talk about humility and uh, emotions and some sometimes how you were almost repressing emotions or suppressing them and so your book titled I am here for you really normalizes talking about feelings and emotions particularly with children mm -hmm. so why did that resonate with you why did you want to talk about emotions and, and with kids in this book okay so this book um, I am here for you this is personal so I especially wrote this book actually for my inner child hmm. and then also my uh, for uh, my daughter she's four um, 
Oh, yeah, this <laughs> one is heavy. It's just that growing up, um, you know, I just have, especially like, grow up, I just have like a lot of like childhood traumas. Mm. So, um, mm, we understand. Yeah, take your time. So um, I just want like I don't know I know that like uh, uh, for the current people or like you know people that grew up in like the war zone and people that mm. you know come from like generation of traumas right um, you know talking about feelings expressing feelings or you know it was it's not like a luxury you know <laughs> like you you can't just sit around and like you know connecting with your parents like let's go we're on the move let's go we're on the run so mm. um, you know now that we're here we'll be in a new home and then you know we're raising like these kids and like I just mm. I just want it better better for my uh, my child better mm. for you know kids that are going to grow up here you know I just want like a more secure kids I want kids that have like you know strong bond uh, bonding with the families and you know parents um, yeah but yeah. yeah and that doesn't mean you abandon your own culture you yeah. just make your own life better and make yes. it work for you yeah. Ramona thank you so much for sharing make can we hear an uh, excerpt from your book? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, you uh, can head up to that microphone if you want. Would you like to sit and read where you're sitting? I'm going to stand up here. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, what about a cup? I'm here for you. And uh, my illustrator is Christmas Pa. She's also a Korean um, artist. She's the first to, you know, illustrate my book. And she's all, this is her first time too. So she's Ooh. the first, yes. And she lives in Colorado. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll read some pages um, in both language. So not, you know, the whole books, but it is pretty short. So I'm here for you. You all pay Ilenovo. Know that Momo and Papa are here for you. Tinyale Momo ra Papa upay lenugo. So Momo, mom's mother, Papa is dead or father. I know that you have a big feelings and must express them. Y tinyale no ora tatu ba dodo mimi de pa don ng Papa plato. And in the books, talking about different feelings, like if you feel happy or frustrated or mad or. Uh, just any kind of emotions or feelings, like, you know, it's okay to express them. Feeling curious. I won't shut you down. You know, ask the questions. I won't, yeah. And I got to the last page. I am here for you and will love you however you feel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ramona. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. So uh, next we're going to open the floor up to audience questions. But before we get to that, um, what, what does this book mean for you personally? For me, it's just, you know, it's just more of like a reminder to me that I am love. And I don't need to earn to be loved. I deserve the love. And then also for this book, I just hope to spark a parent out there, you know. It's like I, parenting is hard for <laughs> yeah. parents, okay. And sometimes, you know, with all this feeling, with all this emotion, you don't know what to do with it, especially for somebody who came from, like, you know, their needs are not being met as mm. a child. And um, yes, yeah, so for me, I just hope to spark. And then also to, you know, whenever I read the book, you know, back then, like when I was a child, whatever I feel, it's like I got shut down. It's like, you know, mm. you're not, you don't feel this, you know, just mm. be a good girl, you know, don't be mad, you know, why are you, why are you crying? So those feelings. And then also for my daughter, you know, it's mm -hmm. okay if she's mad, you know, I would still love her, you know, I won't, I won't, she won't have to question me. I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm being naughty today. Do you still love me? Like, you know, she mm. doesn't need to question me. Yeah, it's just that, just more of like uh, for me and for my So family. healing, it sounds yes. like. And I'm curious, Ramona, what has the reception been? Have you heard from other parents who might relate to you and who read the book and said, you know, this this is great? Or how does that make you feel? What have you been hearing? So... 
not a lot of feedbacks just because like, you know, talking about emotion, expressing feelings and talking about like mental health, especially in my communities. It's still a work in the progress, mm -hmm. so I'm just hoping that, you know, somebody will see the value in this book and then just, you know, just a spark of a conversation starter. Yeah. We have a first audience question for you. Mm -hmm. Did you find the process of writing a book and getting it published difficult? Mm. Oh, so I'm a self-publish, so I did it, yes, everything come out of my pockets. <laughs> 2020 mm. pandemic, I was unemployed. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I stayed with my daughter for um, a few years before that. I, um, I worked in the social services field. So my background is social work. So yes, it was tough. Um, you know, I just felt like not working, not like doing things that I like to do, I love to do, you know, serving the people. I feel like I just lose it some part of myself. But yes, I was <laughs> I was an employee for and then um, yes, it was it was difficult, it was expensive, mm -hmm. and then also it is expensive learning journey just because there is so I don't know. It's like I don't know any current author, so it's so hard. Like I'm like, who do I talk to? Like mm. you know, what advice? You know, I expect also like I moved to Minnesota not too long ago, and I just don't know. You know, anyone that I to reach out to reach out to, and like mm -hmm. you know, of course, like I try to put myself out there. You know, ask you for a question, but still, you know, I just for me, I just have a lot of doubt just because I'm like, okay, I came here to the U.S. as at age 12. I don't know any English then. Mm -hmm. I only learn English at the age of 12 and on, mm -hmm. and I'm not even like a native, you know, English speaker. So just battling with a lot of my inner. Yeah. Sure, that's so relatable. And thank you, Ramona, so much for sharing. And you are definitely putting yourself out there tonight. And I know it's a lot more people are going to hear your story uh, and maybe check out the book. Yes, I am here do. for you. Yes. Uh, Ramona, thank you so much for, and we'll catch up with you again during the right. panel. Thank you. For thank you. Give it up for Ramona, everybody. <laughs> Nina. You have something in common with our next speaker. <laughs> yeah. You both had careers in TV news in Minnesota. Oh my God, all three of us have actually. Well, mine's really in the past far. <laughs> <laughs> and our next uh, panelist is thriving. <laughs> Very so uh, St. Paul native Chinu Her is the first Hmong man to become a TV news anchor in the United States. And he has just returned back to us from Iowa and he is anchoring Fox 9's morning show Show. Let's welcome Chinu to the stage. Thank you. Hello. Oh, it feels good to be home. Yeah. Welcome back yeah. home. Thank you. So how does it how does it feel to be back home and anchor at a news station that you were watching as a kid? Hmm. Uh, it feels like home. I guess that's the easy way, easiest way to put it. It's uh, it's very full circle. Um, I grew up with my parents in the mornings as we get ready for school, as they get ready for work. Uh, we watched Fox 9's morning show, and so to come home and now be on that show in particular that my parents still watch and work alongside other people that I watched growing up, it's mm -hmm. it's very full circle and it, it, it just feeling like home is probably the best way to put it. I mean, that it's the ultimate uh, homecoming. I couldn't have drawn it up any more like picture perfect. You can tell he's the TV person because he's lighting up the room. <laughs> You're like projecting, you know. Usually I'm asleep so, yeah. by now. So, uh, it's natural. Well, thank you for staying up <laughs> with us uh, we're so happy for you and I, I know what that feels like yeah. you know when you've been watching people mm -hmm. growing up and then you admire them and then one day they're yeah. a friend of yours and it's it's pretty amazing uh, and we're lucky to be in the the news market that we're in but it's been a journey for you so yeah. you grew up on the east side of St. Paul you were an anchor at Good Morning Iowa mm -hmm. in Des Moines for a long time I think and so you were there when you became the first male Hmong news anchor in the country yeah. and I've been following you for years uh, on social media, and you've always been um, such an ambassador for the culture, you yeah, know? <laughs> yeah. And I just wonder um, what motivates you to do, to really do that and to really be present for that and for yeah. the community. 
It's always been really important for me to be very true and authentic to that part of me. Mm -hmm. uh, being Hmong, being from Minnesota, being from East St. Paul. Uh, you know, early on when I first was getting into the business, um, you know, I, one of the biggest things that I always faced was, uh, you know, a lot of hiring managers at the time, this was more than 10 years ago, uh, one of the contingencies that I always faced was if I would be willing to use a stage name because mm -hmm. Chinu Her in uh, more rural uh, areas of America was, you know, probably not going to be very attractive to uh, uh, viewers. And so that was always something that I was not willing to compromise. I was willing to move away from my family. I was willing to take jobs for not a whole lot of money, but I was not willing to compromise, you know, that part of me because my name is, it was given to me at birth by my parents, blessed by my grandparents, and my name is very Hmong. And so that was something that I was not willing to compromise. And so um, as I stayed in the business, um, I just really still grasped um, and stuck true to uh, my roots as, as a Hmong American. And um, it's got me this far, so it's worked, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it does take courage. Yeah. It does. I mean, I was scared, you know, because it's, it's uh, being, being young and experienced, you know, do you really say no to a job offer? potentially because of something at that time, I guess, to me, I mean, I didn't know any better, but to me at the time, you know, I would, even in my own mind, kind of go back and forth. Oh, is, is it a huge deal to just, you know, use a stage name? Is that a big deal? But now looking back, I'm glad that I made that decision. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, you stayed true to yourself. So we were talking about this earlier uh, before, before the show started. You know, it, this journey has come with a lot of firsts. How did your family first react when you told them, Mom, Dad, I want to work in news. <laughs> uh, I think a couple uh, speakers already said that tonight. My parents were like, you don't want a real job. <laughs> There's medical school, there's law school, you can be an accountant, you can be an engineer. Uh, yeah, my parents definitely had uh, fears and a lot of questions, but you know, n now yeah, being a little bit older and looking back, I think it was more so concerned because they wanted me to obviously you know, have a career and be able to provide for myself. And we didn't know any phone people in, in TV news, especially at the time. And, you know, it, like like you, so many of you have probably heard before, but when you, growing up, you look at the TV or you watch a movie, you don't see someone who looks like you. So mm -hmm. is this a space that we can be in? And I think that was the concern. Um, and then I one day uh, saw a Hmong news anchor in Wisconsin, Owasso, Wisconsin, uh, Bao Vang, who works uh, for the BBB. Shout out now. to Bao. Yeah, shout out yeah, Bao. Yeah, I know her. So, yeah, you know Bao. <laughs> So um, I was in high school at the time, I believe, and I don't even know how, how I found her email. I, I was, I guess, a little reporter back then, even before I got into the business. <laughs> I found her email and like just cold emailed her and mm -hmm. was like, hey, I'm, I'm Hmong, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about, you know, going to school for this. And she responded and we just kind of stayed in touch, you know, ever since then. And mm -hmm. um, I think once my parents saw like just one person and just one Hmong person in the business, mm -hmm. They're like, okay, well, well, we'll, we'll see like where this goes, yeah. you know. Um, and so, Bao's been very influential uh, in my life, my career ever since then. Amazing, and so many people do that, and, and oh, yeah. within the industry and in different industries, I'm sure. But this kind of leads into an audience question. You know, you mentioned Bao, or people of your own culture, but. How have you navigated uh, being in, you know, predominantly white spaces? Have you experienced like allyship? Uh, because that's predominantly who's around. So mm -hmm. you want to feel accepted there too. Yeah, and you know, that's, uh, I think that is something that why every time I've moved to a new city or I've started a new job at a different station, I've always been very observant. Uh, I trust my gut a lot when I'm going through the process of talking to everybody. And I've been very fortunate to land in uh, stations uh, that have been very supportive of who I am. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm fortunate to be in that position now. I mean, you know, when I uh, came to Fox 9, they were so, they were so so transparent and straightforward, and they wanted me for just me. They didn't want me 
to be this or to be that or to be, to be in this box. They got to know me and they said, okay, that's like, just, just be you. Hmm. And I think that to me really solidified that this was a place I wanted to be. Yeah. Cool. So you're, you're still this uh, significant trailblazer for your community, regardless of what you're, you're doing right now. Um, sorry, I'm tripping on my words. I guess what I'm trying to go is, what has it been like to, to represent Hmong people and in culture across the broader United States now? It's, it's, I mean, first and foremost, it's 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 an honor uh, to to be able to do that, and it is you know like like Mike mentioned earlier, it's 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 a responsibility, and it's something that um, you know I I take seriously, and so, um, and but I enjoy it too because I, I think it it allows me to be able to connect with. Uh, Hmong people from all over. I mean, when when I first started anchoring in Des Moines, um, you know, I would look at our like digital numbers and like who like streaming and stuff, and I'm like, who in Laos is streaming Good Morning <laughs> Iowa? You know? So we were getting our, our morning show streamed from all over the country and even like Laos and Thailand. I'm like, I don't know who's streaming Des Moines Iowa Morning News, but uh, that's pretty cool. Um, and I still get messages from from people all over the country. Um, you know, just glad to see someone who looks like me mm -hmm. in the industry. And, you know, and, and the thing is, like, I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for people like Bao Vang, mm -hmm. uh, Bo Zhang, when she was mm. working at Care 11 way back yes. in the day. I mean, Bo was very, very uh, uh, pivotal in that. Um, Jia Vang, who was yeah. here, um, she was the first Hmong anchor in the Twin Cities. Um, so I had a lot of Hmong sisters that really paved the way for me to, to follow, and they've been great, and they've guided me through it all. So. Yeah. Chinu, we're so glad you're home. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Yeah. yeah, thank you. We'll catch up with you thank after you. this video. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hold on, i got to find my place in our script. <laughs> I think we're tossing a, a nice video here. Oh, yes, we are. This event has come with a lot of a magnificent firsts. Uh, and, of course, we couldn't capture every single person in the world. But we <laughs> did, Sahan did manage to find some time to walk into the community across Minneapolis, St. Paul, and try to get some uh, local voices, see what their firsts were in their families. And if you want to go and divert your eyes to that beautiful face on your my left-hand side, <laughs> we're going to have to play a video for you guys, yeah? <laughs> Just us, just kidding, no. <laughs> We're just waiting. I was to the first person raised here in my family. My first accomplishment would be um, opening up my own salon. Yeah, and without knowing, having any knowledge of anything, I just, I had a passion, I had a goal, and I conquered it. <laughs> uh, I'm the first one to graduate, well, the first male to graduate in my immediate family from high school, first male to go to college, and I'm the only union member and the first one pretty much to buy a house too so I'm, a, I'm the first for a lot of stuff my first accomplishment is becoming a cna in the family i'm actually a first generation korean my parents immigrated here from korea my mom was 15 dad was 25. Um, i'm the first one in my family to get a college education in america my first account accomplishment was going back to school to be a phlebotomist. Me, I'm the seventh generation, so we're kind of breaking that cycle now so that the younger generations can see that. It's a dream that is achievable, and of course, you know, anything great and, and celebratory is gonna take a lot of work, but definitely it's achievable. I wanted to start a business, and that's what I wanted to do, and I've uh, been pretty lucky so far, uh, coming up on 19 years now. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm smart, I, I, I'm just saying a lot of hard work and a lot of luck that go into it. It felt really numb because uh, you don't realize that this is something you can do until you actually do it. And then it's it's like you have um, this feeling where it's like, whoa, did I really actually do this? I think that just being the first is leads a pathway to, you know, to anybody who's coming up behind you as siblings or, you know, even I have foster siblings as well. Not everybody can do that and have to like go through like what you gotta go through as a CNA working at a hospital. I feel like I uh, want to model for um, our Asian community, our Asian students, scholars that, you know, if you put your mind to it, 
it's achievable. I can teach all of my family members, my siblings, my cousins, everybody, you know, how to do certain things and, you know, give them the shortcut so that they don't have to go through the process I had to. I had guidance from my older siblings. They opened up their own business too, but not a physical business. My mom was a CNA slash nurse, mm -hmm. and we grew up watching her as a nurse. My goal was to be a nurse, but nursing school was really hard. And I was going through some difficult things at that time, so I stopped. And phlebotomy was the next thing. When I started that second restaurant after the first successful one, I thought I was the smartest person in the world, right? So the advice that I would give is, you know what? Uh, do your due diligence. Listen to the smart people. Being a firstborn leader, it's, it's, a lot, it's, it's a lot heavier than what people think it is. Um, leadership roles take a lot of being humble and being patient. It sets a standard for the rest of the generation after me so that we can do it and that the older generation they don't have to be the role models no more. Now that I'm a grandmother, I all, now I understand the things that she told me that I, I didn't think I was going to need in my life. Along the way, was it hard? Yes, absolutely. Because, you know, my parents didn't know how to navigate this, the um, uh, system, and so I had to navigate that on my own. But once I got married, my husband was really, really a, uh, a key player in how my success went because he was such a motivator. Success is just based off of what, you're, what you put in your mind, you know? Like, if you doubt yourself, then you're, you're you know, you're going to set yourself up for failure, but if you tell yourself, like, dude, that nothing is going to stop me from accomplishing, then you made success right there from the start of the day. Do not give up. There's always going to be days where you feel like uh, you haven't made it yet, but honestly, do not give up and just keep pushing forward. I've never had anyone in my life tell me I couldn't do it. And my family have always been very supportive very, and, and very thankful for that to have been, had that come from a very well, well uh, nourishing background. I'd like to tell my mother thank you and I love you and I know you're smiling down on me. You may be successful, but on the flip side, you may fail, but by failing, you're gonna learn a hard financial lesson for the next time. So you just gotta find what um, what your passion is and what clicks for you, and that, that really is in and of itself, because there's a lot of people around you that may want you to, may say you can succeed, but you've gotta believe in yourself too. Oh man, I got so much joy, I'm like way up here, <laughs> can't nobody bring me down this is a beautiful thing I'm, I'm living I'm living a good life I'm on the winning side I came to a point where I was like I'm convincing myself to do something I hate I go what if I convinced myself to do something I like if you truly feel that this business is going to succeed go for it uh, and, and, and go ahead and do it. I'm happy, but I feel like my mission is not complete. No, I feel like there's always gonna be more out there. You can accomplish anything you put your mind to. Don't let nobody hold you back or say you can't do something. of this event, uh, Hannah Ikramadeen. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we want to be, you know, conscious of everyone's time, so we're going to do one question and hoping that everyone can take turns uh, giving an answer. Just one more uh, snippet that we wanted with all of you and to see you all on stage together is so beautiful. Uh, for others who are aspiring to be the first in their family or community to do something, what would you give them for advice? Um, let's start, let's just go with Chinu and then go down the, the road. Man, um, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I think I, I would say just know, like have a plan, um, first of all, have a plan, <laughs> and, and just, just 
know like what like what motivates you know where your roots are know who your circle is who's going to prop you up when things don't necessarily go right mm. um because that was the biggest thing that really pushed me through those really really hard times where i would send out 30 40 demo reels mm. applications and i get no responses and i would think that all right this is it like I'm going to go work at Target, you know? Uh, and uh, it was really my parents and my siblings that really kept me going uh, through all of those really tough years. And, um, you know, now they're so very supportive, but they also keep me very grounded so that I'm I'm still, you know, have perspective and I still can, you know, keep myself uh, motivated and keep going. You know, like now they'll be like, you know, I'll be having a good day and they'll be like, all right, you're, you're so short though, right? So calm down, you know? So they, they keep me grounded and, and I appreciate that. And so, yeah, just find those people in your life that can really be real with you and can support you and can keep you grounded and just, you know, stay true to your roots. Totally. Michael? I would probably say um, something my dad told me was anything you do, give it 100%. Um, don't give 70, 80% because there's still that 20 to 30% that you're losing where you could be improving on. And that kind of stuck with me because he said, hey, like if you do that, if you give 100%, you don't have to look back with any regret. And I think that's why right now with me retiring, I don't regret anything. Mm -hmm. Because when I look back on my training, um, my nutrition, everything I put in to become a footballer, that I gave 100%. And mm -hmm. um, you know, I pushed my body to the limit to where I was on my knees, um, trying to get air. Um, obviously, that was all through my dad's training. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, that he, those words that he told me really stuck with me, and that's kind of what I um, lived by throughout my career. And I would really, really um, push that to the next generation. Mm -hmm. And Sometimes. Senator Muhammad? Mm -hmm. Wow, I don't know how you go after that. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I would say, um, first of all, it's important. Well, being the first means you're the first one to do it in your community, right, for whatever you're doing. But there are many other sectors that people are the first to do so. And so speaking with other people who have been the first, talking to other people who, um, who have sort of been through similar experiences. Um, but I would say the most important thing is to, to believe in yourself and to understand why you're doing it. Um, and then create a really small circle that trusts and believes in you and motivates you and it is a lonely process mm. and no one tells you about the applications that you're applying for mm. the no's man the haters um, <laughs> just believe in yourself and and shut off the the negative voices and do what you can mm -hmm. Ramona oh boy okay I'm not good at giving people advice I can't even take my own advice <laughs> but um, I'll say you know vulnerability is not bad thing okay so I guess my advice is more of like just put yourself out there just do it yes it is hard it is a lonely road <laughs> yes and but I'll say you know just do it and then just know who you are you know just be grounded and then you know then the whatever feedback or you know whatever people say is their opinions but you do you and you just be you Mm -hmm. Ebenezer? Uh, don't read the comments. That's what <laughs> I said. <laughs> uh, honestly, it is kind of just a thing of just doing. Because it's like, even if it's like something that you like, nobody you know is done, I'm sure just do the first thing. And I mean, I, different from advice you've heard up here, I say don't plan. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But uh, yeah, just take the first step. Like, don't be too nervous about the outcome because, like, I think the way I thought about it was like, I would rather do this now, fail miserably, and like lick my wounds and like be happy, I guess, with that I like gave something a shot. Like, rather than not do it, but always be like, I could have, you know, uh, yeah, that would be my mm -hmm. advice. And Rodrigo. Well, um, the first thing uh, I recommended to do is define what do you want to do. 
<laughs> set up your goals really, really high. Even if you accomplish really small things, then you're gonna, people, they're gonna see you go really, really, really high. Um, have discipline. Um, and go, go forward. I mean, be brave. I be, I be in this country when I was 32 years old. I don't born in this country, but I mean, yeah, I, it, I don't, I don't believe in the American dream. I believe in, in hard work. I believe in um, discipline. I believe in mm -hmm. goals. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. Um, yes, and I think if you really think where where you wanna be in two years, where you gonna be in three years, where you gonna be in five years, if I can do it, you can do it too. Mm -hmm. Make your dreams a reality. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to all of our trailblazers. Let's give them a round of applause, really. Thank you for your vulnerability and everything that you shared. Chinu, her, Michael Vang, Ramona Tu, Rodrigo Kala, Zainab Mohammed, and of course our wonderful performer tonight, Ebenezer Murdasad. Again, just another round of applause. Thank you so much, truly. And of course, we want to thank our sponsor one last time. This event wouldn't be possible without the generous uh, sponsorship of Minnesota Home Ownership Center. Don't forget to meet with one of their home ownership advisors after the program to learn about the first generation home buyers community down payment assistance fund. That's a mouthful. <laughs> and get your sweet grab bag. They do have oven mitts, which I needed one. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for everyone at Sahan Journal, NPR News, and the St. Paul New or Neighborhood Network for helping us organize organize this, produce and broadcast this wonderful event. Finally, thank you all of us who joined us here in St. Paul and were willing to listen to us yap for a while. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.